games going on. It could be argued that taking even in death might help Tyrael's survivability if some opponents will avoid killing him because of that talent. I mean, every, anytime you can get a kill, you should just get a kill. It's possible to juke the even in death um, after the fact. But, alright. Think of this game. So we have Please on Gul'dan, it's probably gonna be the solo laner. We have Moose on Nova, Alpha Wolf on Arthas, Chu on Raynor, and Maijal on Ariel. Versus Beauregard on Anubarak, Hell on Li Ming, Oblivia on Tassadar, Suspected on Lunara, and Sonya on Hinokala. So we have a soul support Tassadar. We don't have an especially strong soul in here. I mean, Tassadar can soul lane, but then you don't have any sustain. Can you still just mount and walk away from Tyrael? Uh, no. I actually know the answer to that one. You can't do it. For those of you who are curious, it used to be possible if Tyrael died and you instantly mounted to actually get out of his explosion radius just by mounting and walking away because the 40% movement speed. 30% is not enough. But even in death, it doesn't work because he has the mobility from Q. Although you can still juke with the movement speed, so it's a factor. Nicola getting destroyed. And this is the problem. I mean, Sonya's an acceptable solo laner, uh, but it doesn't end up working out. But they're doing it. They're doing something really weird here. Look at this. They're doing a 3-1-1. Look at this. 3-1-1 on Dragonshire. You almost never see 3-1-1 on Dragonshire. Normally this is the solo lane, but Alpha Wolf is just going to be up here, clearing the wave. Chu as well. Chu did go see some Marksman. Let's see how this works out. Not entirely sure. Dragon's power is yours. A hero has abandoned. That should be a free Dragon Knight for Blue Team. It is. That's a minute and twenty-eight second Dragon Knight. That's absolutely insane. That's almost the fastest you can get a Dragon Knight. Where does Rainer stand in this patch overall? Uh, Rainer's the same in this patch as he was in the previous patches. He has, if you have a team protecting him, he's the safest auto attack hero, except maybe Hammer. Hammer, I think, is arguably better than Rainer um, in the vast majority of scenarios. But it's not like he's bad, it's just that he gets overshadowed by all the other heroes that do safe long range damage. Like, look at. Now that. Let's look at, let's look at Rainer. Rainer has 20% increased base range, well, so does Hammer. Uh, Rainer has Inspire. But Hammer does comparable AA damage anyway, so Inspire is only really relevant when it's helping other people. Uh, Rainer has Revolution Overdrive. Hammer has Thrusters built into the base kit. Um, Rainer has Adrenaline, Adrenaline Overload. Uh, Hammer almost always takes first aid. Pretty comparable so far. Hammer has Siege Mode versus Mines. Or, uh, Hammer has Siege Mode versus like nothing. For Hammer. Uh, Hammer's knockback is easier to hit, but a shorter range. Doesn't have a sun option built into it. And Hammer has mines. That's a lot of like tick marks in Hammer's favor. I think Hammer might just be strictly better than Rainer. The only reason that wouldn't be true is because of Hyperion and Inspire. So if you if you have an auto attack team that you're increasing their auto attack and it actually matters, um, like Karazim is a little bit better with increased auto attack speed, Butcher, um, if you're racing immortals on BOE, matters. Although Hammer does that better, actually, too. But um, Hyperion. Hyperion's the big reason to take Rainer right now, in my opinion. There's other scenarios where Rainer would be better than Hammer, but I think overall Hammer's better than Rainer in the current like incarnation of them. I think Rainer needs a little bit of a health buff, to be honest. The health nerf he got several patches ago is was just too much. It made him too weak. But he's still the easiest ranged AA hero to play by a huge margin. So if you're new to the game, like, and you, if you're new to the game and you want to play a ranged auto attack hero, I encourage you to play Rainer because he's the easiest one to play by a huge margin, and he's very effective even when played at like an average level. For those of you who are, are wondering, I believe there was a DC early on in the game. 
And uh, this this Anubarak is actually a bot for like the first 10 or 15 minutes of the game. I think. I think this is. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's, I'm gonna go check the Discord. Yeah, bot first part of the game. I remembered it correctly. I will say Hyperion's an incredibly incredible powerful zoning ult. Like if you're on shrines, you throw an Hyperion down on top of the shrine. You should usually win that shrine. If you're pushing with a Punisher and you throw down Hyperion, you should usually guarantee whatever building you threw it down on. Just because they have to back off or take the free damage. Like, Hyperion's a crazy good heroic. The poke is real. This is one of the problems with, um... Oh god, he went Q build. This is one of the problems with Arthas. Uh, he doesn't have any way of dealing with uh, spell damage. He doesn't even have a spell shield at 13. So if you're up against Li Ming as Arthas, you probably want to draft something else. Um, and overall, honestly, their draft is like... This draft is pretty weak to these heroes. The Soul Sport Tastar is the only thing that's going to be really rough to deal with. I imagine the Anubarak was a denial pick just to get out Li Ming. I don't understand why Alpha Presence is going to pick up here again. I feel like people like have a build for Li Ming and just haven't reevaluated it since the multiple changes that the game has gone through. And it looks like a new brack is back. And everyone is happy to see him. Wisp guarding the point, bear guard rotates down, Sunny gets picked off in the top lane. Apparently she wasn't spinning to win hard enough. Oblivia gonna push this lane out, make sure that there's no vision of the cap point, which means red team does not know, or blue team, excuse me, does not know for a fact whether or not someone is on it. Meanwhile, bear guard gonna rotate down the bot lane and cap that shrine. Denying the second Dragon Knight, very nicely done. And they're just gonna continue with this nonsense push in uh, with Arthas in the top lane. Maijal plus Arthas, or Ariel plus Arthas, not such a great combination. Arthas is quite that much damage, especially because he did go Death Lord, uh, Immortal Coil. He'd be doing much more damage with uh, Bite Full, and he'd have more self sustain with either, you know, Ice Bump Fortitude for Denial or Rune Tap. But... I'm going to get rotated on. Actually, ends up going down. Alpha Wolf as well. Not any mobility uh, options going to allow him to get out of this. We do see Barragar going through the wall. Nice Burrow Charge. And with the Impale follow up, with all of that damage, Alpha Wolf is also completely out of mana. They should be able to kill him here. Suspected. Suspected. Nice. Does end up going down. But 10 is picked up. And Moose manages to get the counter kill with his Precision Nova. Very nicely done. So it ends up being a two for one despite all of the shenanigans. Meanwhile, Gul'dan pushing in the bot lane, gets the well and half the fort. Uh, Gul'dan actually has pretty impressive wave clear. We do see him going for kind of a wonky build, the full uh, uh, the full sustain and lane build, essentially. Push, 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 push. This actually isn't a bad solo laning build. I don't think it's the best build overall for Gul'dan, but if you're gonna be in a lane all game long and try and just dominate that lane really hard, which is something you can do in Dragonshire. Although again, normally that's the top lane. I don't entirely understand the decision to have the top lane be a tri lane while it's 1-1 one -one versus a four man. It, nah, nah. Laning arrangements in this game are are, uh, are hero league. It's, all, it's the best way of saying it. The laning arrangements in this game are hero league laning arrangements. They're not really optimal. They're just kind of what happened because people have their own ideas. People don't respect Gul'dan. I mean, Gul'dan's seen professional play in two or three games. Um, I think Gul'dan's one of the strongest solo laners in the game. The problem is Zagara was so much better. And then I think Thrall beats him in lane as well, although it is much closer. Cinder Ghost is going down, allowing him to fight under the tower, but that isn't actually a factor. Blue Team actually getting grabbed. Ooh, the Dragon Knight. 
off of that, but that ends up being a two kills for free to grab the Dragon Knight. That can be worthwhile depending on how much value this Dragon Knight gets. That is the support in it, which means I wouldn't have been able to team fight very effectively with the Dragon Knight anyway. So Chu just standing here, delaying the rotation, being like, if you don't get on top of my Dragon Knight, we're gonna be good. <laughs> Jukes the Jukes the Burrow Charge, Moosrick to Downs for the kill, and you gotta ask yourself the question of why would you try and 1v1 uh, an auto-attack hero as a new rack when you get countered by auto attack heroes as a new rack. You're really only a tank against ability damage dealers. And uh, you're not a tank versus AA. Oops. I, there was literally no way that fight was going any other way than the way it went. Even if Moose hadn't rotated down, I'm pretty sure that was still a dead new rack. Fairguard is alive and well. Now, however, 13 talent tier picked up for both teams. We do see Frigid Winds pick up for the attack speed slow. What? Like, I, I guess this is good against Sonya. This is good against Sonya. That's it. That's, it's good against Sonya. Okay. I like to point out they didn't take block at level 1. If you're actually afraid of auto attack heroes, you take block. Right, at level 1 is Arthas, particularly if you're the main tank, which he is in this case. So didn't take block, but took Frigid Winds. Build makes no sense. Build makes no sense. I mean, if he's not, if he, if he's not going to take block, I want to see him not take Frigid Winds. Um, Trail of Frost would've been fine. He took the level 1 talent for the trait, so even the, the upgrade at 13 for the reduced cooldown would've been fine. But it just, it doesn't make sense to not take block and then take Frigid Winds. It just, it just fundamentally does not make sense. Because Frigid Winds significantly increases the value of block by allowing the charges to come back uh, more quickly between attacks that you're actually absorbing with block. There's a, there's a synergy there. It's, it seems like he's just sort of looking at his talents and picking kind of random. Cindergrosa allows the pickoff on the Nara. And this is this is a, a major problem that Arthas has in general as a tank. He has, a, except for Cindergrosa, he has no engage potential. But Cindergrosa is one of the best engages in the game because of the massive, massive slow. So Cindergrosa engaging for his team, allowing that pickoff to secure it. An easy C would have just, you know, power slid, or Murda would have jumped in and storm bolted. Arthas actually had to burn his heroic to secure that kill, but it does get secured. And we do see um, Hatirian coming down, zoning, getting that siege damage, and they're going to get bottom four off of it as a result. Nicely done. Meanwhile, Nova 1v1ing Anubarak. And that's going to be a dead Anubarak, because there's no way he gets out of the situation. Counter Burrow Charges in, actually kills the Nova. Uh, trades one for one. Considering he's behind, that's actually a worthwhile trade. And. At that point, Nova should have just backed off. When your whole team's collapsing on a single target and you're trunk, just leave. You don't need to be there to help them. They can kill him. That's fine. They're going to get it. Moose did not believe in his team, and as a result, he has 30 seconds to think about his uh, decisions about not believing in his team. Chu going to take quite a lot of damage here. Aegis with the save will help quite a bit. Lunara's poison guaranteeing the fall off. And here's, a, here's one of the best ways of dealing with Aegis. You see how Suspected was waiting for the timing and instantly hit the Q as soon as Aegis stopped because it has a little bit of a cast time. Anytime someone is going to come out in a position where you know they're going to come out for certain, the follow-ups can be absolutely crisp and perfect. Dahaka's Burrow, Zagara's Maw, um, Crystal Aegis, uh, Void Prison, like any stasis effect that can't be cancelled, you can just make your follow-ups perfect, and if the person was low, you can usually guarantee the kill, as we saw there. It's one of the reasons we uh, see a lot of people pick up Diamond Resolve, I think it is, the level 20 upgrade for Aegis, because that resistance makes sure that those follow-ups don't get as much value. We usually see Shield of Hope, um, but Diamond Resistance is a really good talent, and let's say that if, if they're you know trying to kill the Aegis target with immediate follow-up, that will, will deny a lot of that pick potential. Snowballing the map, painting the map red off the backs of those kills. And this is just something you can do to get a little bit ahead. Once you're once you're ahead in terms of tempo on the map because of death timers, you should try and do as much as you can to get ahead, ahead on the map 
to further that advantage. That can mean getting camps. It can mean getting buildings. It can mean getting the objective. Getting camps and the objective is just a really low cost to save thing to do. Lou's trying to deny here. Uh, Li Ming did not pick up Force Armor at level 1, for the record, and you should almost always pick up Force Armor versus a Nova, because otherwise you just die a lot. Um, ends up working out. Oblivia with the shields manages to save health from taking any significant real damage. Cannoneer actually has uh, no synergy at all with Legion Plasma because it does ability damage. I would actually like it if Cannoneer did like, increase the base amount of your regular auto attacks that work with Legion Plasma. Of course, if Giant Killer or Tychus' trait works that way, it would be a little broken. And then I, but I would also really like that because it would make Cassadar uh, pretty ridiculously strong in certain compositions and weaker in others. It would be, it would be, it would be more of a dynamic in the draft about whether or not you can or take Cassadar. Cassadar's already so strong that giving him an indirect buff like that would be pretty questionable. Again, Cinder Gosa for the uh, engage, but on a flank this time by himself. Uh, Arthas has no personal mobility. He can slow down everyone else, but he can't speed himself up, so he actually should have just died there, but the team didn't collapse. He said they're going to collapse on everyone else. Suspected getting out. Uh, Migel is going to end up going down as his moose. Leaning resets are real. Precision Strike not getting any value whatsoever. And unfortunately, Li Ming is out of... I don't know. It's... Okay. So the benefit of Astral Presence is that even when you're out of mana, you can continue to poke forever. So why is Li Ming, like, out of mana? This, this doesn't actually matter. She can still poke. She's never actually going to come completely out of mana. She can just sit there for a few seconds and regen enough to continue to poke the buildings. The question, the question is always, are they low on health? Because they don't have a hero who actually restores real health, they only have Tassadar. But Tassadar's out of mana, which... Okay, that, that matters a lot. But Li Ming could have just stayed forever. As you can see, she's not... She look, she's just sitting here. She's, she, her mana is totally irrelevant. She's fine. It's Astral Presence. It is not Power Hungry. It should be Power Hungry, but it's not. Oldan, with his crazy good wave clear, gonna clear up his camp pretty much instantaneously. But when you're behind, when all of your lanes are pushed in, when all of your lanes are pushed in, usually the easiest way to push your lanes out is to grab camps. So if all of your lanes are pushed in, in and you grab all the camps, then the other team can't grab any of the camps and they push their lanes. Your lanes are going to stay pushed in and therefore secure the camps, which means they're going to be visible on the map. And if they're visible on the map, there's a chance you can rotate and pick them off. It's one of the reasons that when people are dead, we, in, even in high level games, depending on the length of the we actually see camps prioritized over buildings because it pushes the lane in and that leads to a tempo advantage later on in the next like minute, minute and a half. And this is, again, a thing high-level players think about. They think about what's going to happen a minute from now. They think about what's going to happen two minutes from now. Um, and they make the decision based on that. Not just on what the most easily available value is, but what can we do now that will guarantee us a lot of value soon. Right? They're investing, shall we say. They're trying to invest in their future. Top four is going to go down. It's going to give them a little, even more of an experience that they will eventually get to 20. And at this point, because red team is ahead, they don't need to fight. They just want to get 20. Uh, with the uh, Dragon Knight coming up, a fight's probably going to have to happen anyway. We see Leaf coming in instantly, E just for the save. Hyperion going down, but Nova gets instantly erased off of that Leaf. Very nice Leaf from Inakola. And Klee's going to go down as well. The van just too far forward. And this Chu Chu as well. And that's an ace. That's 20. They can just end bot. They don't actually even need to get the Dragon Knight. If they had a global, if they had a global, they could um, send someone send someone top, send one person mid, and get the Dragon Knight. But they don't need it. The best call here is five man and bot. Li Ming making a the, the literally the worst possible decision she could make here. Literally the worst possible decision. Sonia not making a good decision either. Grabbing this camp. Uh, they just they just end. They just end. And they're not doing it. We see Bear Guards tanking the building with this heroic. Absolutely insane. They can still end. They can still end. This game is... 
Okay, so this is the 16 minute mark. This game goes to 20, 20, 2127. This game is over. This game is like straight over. They could have just ended right here. This core, this core could be dead. I mean, Sonya wasn't there, and Locust Swarm gives a noob a lot of sustain. So they get the middle keep, like, instantaneously, but they just waste the Dragon Knight. So that's two full lanes of Catapult Pressure. And at this point, they've... A noob had to burn his Heroic to get the keep. Like, he had to burn his Heroic to live through the keep just shooting him. He needed to tank for it. So now they're down a Heroic. Um, Hyperion's coming up off of cooldown. Cindy is gonna be up in 80 seconds. So, this, I mean, this is a fight they could take. Horrify was already used. Leap comes in for the counter engage. Pinnacola misses his Q. Hyperion zones everyone out. And aggressive out of mana for charge in by Barricard. That's, that's just easy death. Like, that, that death should not have happened. He should have Burrow Charged out, not in. You can't go in at no mana. If you're a hero who has zero mana and you go in, you're just dying for free. Like, you can't do anything without mana, unless you're, like, an Illidan um, or, like, a Murky or something. Like, you don't have mana to begin with. That's a little bit different, but that was just, that was just, hey, let me help you catch up a little bit by feeding you a free kill. So, if Red Team loses this game, we can actually put it 100% on the Li Ming and the Sonya, because they could have ended and they didn't come. And now everyone's... And, and, and Tassadar went to end. I don't understand why he's playing the Mini of the Noob. Like, did the right thing when he was here. Sometimes people DC. But... I, could, I guess I can check choose season marksman quest if I do. So it is finished. All right. And at this point, red team's together mostly. They're right here. Blue team's a little bit split because Gul'dan is right there, but he's rotating down. Um, and Hanakolo finds Alpha Wolf, gets absolutely chunked. Wow, does not have pre-shields. Uh, actually, a lot of people on the team lacking pre-shields, unfortunately. Uh, does pick up Ignore Pain at level 20, so that is available. He has his defensive cooldowns if he needs them. Hell going for the zoning. Uh, disintegrate there, it is going to be on cooldown. Does uh, so much damage to Alpha Wolf right there. Trying to uh, pop some Negrosa essentially for a disengage here. The follow up to Aegis is not going to be good enough to secure the kill. And Bjorg, so low, uh, Precision Strike does not manage to finish him off. And this is an ugly fight. Trasking is strict. Whoa! Feed me see more. Thank you, TB Tony. Uh, Taster did not take Dimensional Shift or Dimensional Warp at 16. That's a huge mistake. If you're a soul support Tassadar, one of the ways you soak damage for your team is by literally soaking damage for your team and then healing up with the combination of Prescience, uh, your E and Dimensional Orb, and, and even a 20 you can make rerun, you get three every 45 seconds, essentially. Uh, three full, basically full heals. Um, not taking that is a huge mistake because it means that if you absorb any damage in a fight, you don't have any way for covering your own damage. Your AA is not enough for leeching plasma to matter. And once you're once you're chunked, you're out of a fight. You can't uh, aggressively absorb damage for your team, which is one of the ways that you heal. You aggressively absorb damage for your team and then heal yourself efficiently because of the synergy between all those talents. Resonation's a shitty talent. Like it's a, it's a shitty slow. It doesn't even doesn't even make sense to take resonation even when res even even when you don't take uh, dimensional warp for some reason. So that that is just such a bad decision. And again, they didn't end the game when they could have. And now they're in a situation where they got they gave away two free kills. Uh, Tassadar could have stayed in that fight if he'd had the self heal. Could have kept shielding. It would have uh, at a minimum the new I think would have lived. The Sonya might have just been too far overextended. But I didn't even I wasn't even looking at that. And that is such a bad decision. Okay.
red, blue team not splitting here. They know they're only uh, there's only three people alive, so they're like, we're gonna come down here and cap this as five. There's only three of you. You can poke us, but you can't actually kill us. They managed to delay this long enough that they can get it one interrupt. They should manage to have a fight going on. Hey, Fangby. And this is the fight. This is like all the marbles sort of fight. Whoever wins this should be able to get a Dragonite and send the game. Leap comes in onto Alpha Wolf, doing a lot of zoning. Nova gets instantly erased in the back line. Please, as well, is massively overextended. Fear's out. Fear's actually out of his own self-sustain, and they're going to be able to collapse on him and kill him basically for free. That will be a free kill on Gul'dan. There we go. And now that they're already top, they might as well send one person to get that nice, clean cap. Pinnacola on the bottom, doing the same thing. And they're going to be able to cap this mid very effectively. And this should be game. This should be game. Poor Chu, he deserves a better team. I mean, anytime you see full keyboard Arthas in, uh, as a tank, you, you know you're in bad shape. Anything you see in Death Lord picked up, you, you know you're in for a bad time, to be honest. Uh, the difference in win rate uh, on Arthas' level 4 talents, especially in High Lamar, is pretty stark. It's pretty stark. And in EU, a scene where Arthas has played like, extensively, much more so than he has played in, in NA or even um, Korea, or even China. High level players will literally like laugh at you for doing Death Lord. I, I was talking to some high level EU tank players when I was writing my Arthas guide, and they like straight up giggled when Death Lord was ever mentioned. <laughs> they were like, that's such a dumb talent, you should never take it. I was like. Some of them said really mean things. Like, toxic things about people seeing people take it in Hero League and being like, man, I just wanted that guy to lose. I mean, Ariel should never go solo, in general. Being split from your team is is just a bad thing in general, but that happened after Red threw the game. <laughs> I mean, Red could have won and then didn't, and any decision-making after that point is just, I don't know, not as relevant. 